Welcome to the Indie Writer Podcast, where we talk all things writing and indie publishing. Today, Becca and I are excited to be talking about beta readers with Alex Morrissey. Alex's professional career began when he wrote and drew a Nick Fury Shield comic for Marvel. He then created for other publishers, such as DC and Dark Horse Comics. Following this, Alex became an art director, designing for companies such as Google and Condé Nast. He is the co-host of Draw, Drink, and Podcast, a comic industry interview-based streaming show. His most recent novel, Black Fire, is a science fiction fantasy epic that blends D&D adventuring parties dynamics with high-energy galactic action. Welcome, Alex. We're so excited to have you today. Hey, how are you guys doing? <laughs> Good. Oh, doing? I'm, I'm thrilled. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to talk about about this mythical subject of beta readers. Yeah. So the reason I picked you is because you're kind of right in the thick of it, which yes. I know. I am up to my uh, eyeballs in, uh, in the beta reader process. It's a, <laughs> it's a challenging process. I'm sure it would be simplified if one had lots of money, but one has to solve problems in different ways. Yeah. Just to get rolling and Becca and I can just chime in where we want, because I know we've both been through this process as well. When did you personally decide that your story was ready for beta readers? So at what point in the editing process did that seem like, okay, now's the right time to get some outside feedback? Yeah, right. I probably had done maybe four drafts of my novel, and everything was kind of becoming a more focused piece. At least I felt it was becoming a more focused piece. But I got to that point where I don't feel as I could have kept any more ideas in my thoughts or things to pay attention to in my head as I was going through the draft. And while fixing the problems I already knew existed, I wasn't probably able to see what was happening uh, or not happening Mm -hmm. in the story. So I had this sort of high-minded idea of saying, okay, well, I can't really fix this myself. And I'm going to I'm going to hire some beta readers and t- and take care of this this problem. And people were relatively quick. I put up a a notification on Twitter for beta readers and I I got a few bites. There are clearly some people out there who this is their business model is to you know to have uh clients through beta reading and I had a nice list all set up and then I I got waylaid by somebody who I really I was really interested in, I I liked what they were doing in their writing. So I thought, okay, there'll be a great sort of fit. So I reached out to this person and uh, they came back with this astronomical quote. Oh, wow. Which was north of $4,000 to do a a beta read. Yeah. And and for the people who are listening, (laughs) you you should have seen the looks on, on Becca and Jackie's faces right there. And I was really polite and I thought I was I had made a mistake so I I Mm -hmm. went back and forth with this person trying to clarify my position like I'm not asking for editorial you know services or guidance and any some such I have 15 questions sitting in a pdf that all you have to do is type in the little boxes and after reading the book and I know that's a big ask to begin with what would you charge for that and the response was I think my my price is is fair and I said okay well and I, on. <laughs> right. And so at that moment, you know, I was really at my wits end of the, and I was just not pleased with the process. And then my, my wife being smarter than me at all times said to me, like, well, have you asked anybody like, you know, <laughs> and I said, well, no. So I thought I would get a quicker response. Just here, I pay you money, you do the job, that's it. And and I said, well, okay, let me just see who's out there. So I, I then reached out to, you know, I think eight or nine people and all of them were real quick to respond to say, sure, I'll do it. I said, oh, wow, thank you. Okay. And so can I ask what the reasonable <laughs> quotes you got were? How much would you say is like actually reasonable for answering those 15 questions? The, the other ones were ranging from between $200 to $500. My book is long. So there's, it seems like there's this, if you look at people that did sort of, they set them up with a, 
a word count threshold. So from this point to this point, it's X amount of dollars, this point to this point. My book is way past their top, you know, quote mark. And, I, and I'm and i doing the math. I'm like, OK, so I'm 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 generally in the four to five hundred dollar range for each person. And I said, well, geez, if I'm going to get a quality if I'm going to try to get the analytics that I need to have to get some cross sections and weigh one person's observations against another person's observations, it's going to cost me a lot of money. So that's when I listen to the, you know, the wisdom of my, my smarter half. So Becca, what does that process look like for you? We can kind of jump down since Alex brought it up to just talking about, I guess the pros and cons of hiring beta readers versus asking friends to beta read, because I've definitely found pros and cons to both. Paid beta readers, obviously, they can kind of turn it around faster. They're spending, they're earning money, and they'll give you maybe more detailed feedback than you would get from a friend who is doing you a favor. What does that look like for you? I've never hired beta readers. My first novel I had just kind of sent out to like way too many people. And I was like, look, I wrote a book because <laughs> I had no idea at that point what developmental editing looked like and how intense it was. But it was also like you're saying it was it's my sister and my mom and my cousin. And they're like, it's so great. We're so proud of you. We love you. And didn't really get any meaningful feedback. And then the people mm-hmm. I sent it to who were like indie authors who I kind of new through mutual friends were just like, Haha, good job. And I'm sure it's just because they thought I was a terrible writer and not. <laughs> so <laughs> no, really, you should read the, <laughs> the original draft that I sent to people. And then with my second novel, I ended up trading because neither of us could afford to hire the beta readers that we wanted to. And so Tahani, who we love mm-hmm. here, you know, Tahani and I traded drafts and we gave each other that kind of overarching developmental first read feedback. Okay. And it was great because she is a friend, but I knew that she was going to, she wasn't going to hold things back. So she was nice about her <laughs> criticism, but she was also honest about it because she knew that that's what I wanted. She knew I wanted real feedback. Did you feel that you got any constructive criticism and feedback in that first, with your first novel and you, your first attempt? No, not really. Except okay. the only thing I can think of is my sister was like, I loved it. I read it overnight but in the first chapter you mention her sister and then later you say she's an only child so she noticed that I cut (laughs) her out of it like her character out of it but that was (laughs) the only thing she really commented on that's kind of the similar experience that I had was that I would have friends and family read it and they would be overwhelmingly positive, but you could tell they were kind of just placating you because they love you and are excited you wrote a book. But they would, they would still be like one or two things that they would find, like an inconsistency or I didn't really, you know, wasn't connecting with this character. So I felt there was a little bit in there. I went the route of kind of what both of you did, where I, I did do like trades with like a critique partner for my first book. And then I also did kind of do what Alex did, but on the cheaper scale, I went to Fiverr and I actually found a few beta readers on Fiverr that were able to do it for about $50. And at one point I just did like three of them and they had all the feedback back really quickly. And that was very valuable because they all turned around, you know, a two to three page document with really great notes. And then as, you know, we're getting to know more people in the writing community, I now feel like, okay, I have these other writers who would certainly read my work and I would read theirs. And we just kind of trade back and forth. And so that's been really nice. And that was my quid pro quo, you know, offer to many of the people. I said, listen, I know you have course some, you know, underway and I'm happy to read for you in return for what you're doing for me. So that seems to be, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the middle of doing a beta read right now as a result. Okay. So One quick question I had was, have either of you ever used like an alpha reader? So used someone to bounce the novel back and forth with before you even get to the point of needing a beta reader. So someone who's just looking at a very early draft of the book and you're asking them, okay, do you think I have something here? Do you think the plot is going where it needs to go? I think that's essentially what I did with my family and friends (laughs) in the first place. And that did kind of give me, I, I mean, that's a great point. Like, it did kind of give me the encouragement, even if it is from people close to me, that this was worth working harder on because some people would enjoy it. I also, Kendra, another writing block friend, looked at a first draft of a novel of mine, which I'm not really 
going to have go anywhere. And that was helpful. But I think, and I'm sure we'll get into this, you have to be really clear about the kind of feedback you want, because she was giving me these really intense line edits, which I almost feel bad that I that she spent so much time on it, because it's, you know, line edits disappear when you're going to change mm-hmm. the whole thing around. So yeah, I've had a couple alpha readers, and it is nice kind of knowing whether something's worth pursuing or not. Okay. Well, that leads us kind of into the next question, which is for people listening, what, as a writer, what is most valuable for you to receive from a beta reader? For me, it's what's not working. You know, I guess, you know, either if it's not working or if they are losing interest, you know, where do they feel that they they want to put the book down? So those are the two sort of crucial elements, I think, because, you know, the, the last thing you want someone to do is to not not want to read your book. I think I like character feedback. I feel like that's where I struggle most as a writer is like giving enough characterization to my, to my people Mm -hmm. (laughs) and, or it's not even giving enough. It's more just that I get, I feel so close to my characters that I don't even know like the broader view of who they are, if that makes sense. And so Mm -hmm. like with, the one that Tahani looked at for me, she was like, oh, she's like super self-conscious and she's super feeling guilty about this. And I hadn't even put that together, like that that was her overarching characterization. And so just getting somebody else's impression of who my my people are is helpful for me. Right. And Alex, I noticed I'm actually, disclosure, I'm beta reading for Alex at the moment. <laughs> And so I got a little sneak peek into how you approach your beta readers. And Alex kind of came up with a form to fill out. And so tell us a little bit about that and why you thought that was important and how it helps you kind of communicate with your beta readers on the type of feedback you want to get. For me, I think the first consideration I had, I mean, so, you know, going back a bit, you know, the whole process of beta reading and we were talking and briefly talking about alpha reading, it is not dissimilar to the design process when you're working in a firm or you're working for a corporation. You don't get that luxury of sitting in your office and tinkering some up some some design and then ta-da, here's my design and this is what's going to be what we're spending the next, you know, two years spending millions of dollars on. It, it, there's a whole give and take. I needed to make sure that in design, there's a thing called the design brief. And a design brief is what you create to structure the guidelines of what the project that you're working on will be. So that way you don't go off reservation. And if you do attend to all the sort of issues that are in the brief, but yet the client or your marketing department says, oh, this doesn't do it for us. You go, well, let's look at the brief and make sure that we're you know, where we, you know, missed, missed the mark. So it's sort of kind of a post brief in that respect. And it also takes care of the, I just read the book and I want to talk to you and tell you about the book. And all that information just disappears into the ether because it's not written down. You know, it's like that great idea you have for your book and then you forgot to write it down and you just have that little corner of it and you go, what was that? It was, so I, I, had to have a set of, you know, story guidelines for the reader to put down. So I would know what there is. So then when, let's say you, Jackie, put your feedback in that box and I look at the other, you know, seven people, I can compare those, you know, pieces of information. Can you give us some examples of what, what you're asking for in that document? Like sure. One of the line items would be. Yeah. So like the first question is, did the story hold your interest from the very beginning? And if not, why not? So, mm-hmm. you know, because we all know that the opening is so important as far as, you know, getting a reader to invest their time into your story. So we need to make sure that, you know, at least I need to make sure that that story is the story that someone wants to start with. And, you know, so then I ask whether they were oriented into the story. Like, where are you? Are you sitting in this world do you understand where you are and then do you understand the main characters can you relate to them can you relate to their situation and then you move uh you know is the, is the setting interesting to you so i sort of subsequently build on these these questions to move through you know story setting and character and in different fashions 
did you guys have any questions for your beta readers or did you just say, read it and tell me what you think? You know, it was interesting because for my first book, I didn't really know many writers yet. And so I did do some of those Fiverr gigs trying to find beta readers. And a lot of them had their own document they were filling out uh, that was similar, it sounds like, to what you were asking, where they would kind of go over the whole arc of the story and then break down each character. And so I kind of used that going forward as just a model. With this most recent book, I then turned to people who kind of already knew my writing style. And so, for instance, I actually had the developmental editor from my first book do a beta read on my second book. And so I already kind of trusted his instincts about that. And I think that as you form some of those writing relationships, you um, start to know each other's weaknesses and where they need help flushing out the story. And so I do always ask, I think my big thing, and this is definitely genre dependent, where Becca is probably more focused on character arc with her genre that Alex and I are both writing sci-fi. And so the world building is a really important part of it. So I just wanted to make sure that that the plot was consistent was my biggest thing for a beta reader. And then I can kind of go in and, and tweak those characters. But I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't dipped, that someone was gonna not going to pick up one chapter and be like, this is not believable at all, is where a lot of my downfall can be. <laughs> and so that, that was kind of where I tell people to have an eye out. And then also an eye out just for any character they don't feel like they can picture. Because I think Kind of like what Becca was saying, like, they're so clear in our heads. We know them very well, but we don't necessarily know how other people are receiving them. And we have the answers to their motivations and, you know, their personality. But that doesn't mean that we're making that clear on the page. So those were kind of my my biggest things that I, I then relay that to the beta readers and just say, keep an eye out for this. And then also the story that I just wrote is a sequel. So it was very important to me that the ending was satisfying. And so that was like, were you satisfied <laughs> was another question just to make sure that ending was complete. Yeah. How about you, Becca? Yeah, I just kind of gave my people a general what works, what doesn't work question. But I'm thinking about your, your sheet, Alex, and I'm thinking I would be much more excited to beta read for people if they gave me a sheet like that, because I feel really tempted to kind of do as close to a developmental edit for somebody as I can. <laughs> uh, but if I just had questions to answer, it would take a lot of that pressure off. So I think I definitely want to do that for my readers going forward. I'll be happy to mail it to you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, I, In the mail. Know. Well, it's, with a you know, stamp. right. It's funny yeah, with a stamp. Yeah. I'll put it on a floppy disk and I'll mail it to you. <laughs> yeah, no, it, no, it's interesting because I, you know, I gave, uh, I printed out a handful of hard copies of the book because, you know, why not? And I, I did it thinking that I may, some of the readers who were handed, you know, digital copies might prefer to have a hard copy available. So I just made sure I had them sort of in the wings. And my wife said, you know, I want to read the book. So, okay. So I hand her the book. And so she dives in and starts reading it, but she sits there on the couch reading it with this. And I'm sitting there and I'm <laughs> working at my computer and I hear, Shh, you know, <laughs> you know, all, you know, he's every, holding up a highlighter for all. Oh of our, yeah, I guess um... so. Yeah. I'm so used to pictures. Yeah. So I, I see she's holding on. Yeah. So she highlights, you know, so I hear the highlighter making the hiss across the page uh, every minute or two. So, I mean, she's pulling out great stuff, but as you said, Becca, th this is, you know, she's doing a line edit. And if, you know, <laughs> I might just be, you know, you know, selecting all and deleting for all this work that she's going through. So, yeah. Right. Well, that's another thing to talk about is I'm sure we've all beta read for other people. And so how do you organize your thoughts on someone else's book? What does that look like? I know for me, what I'll generally do is I'll keep I'm usually reading on the Kindle or on my phone if I'm reading an, an arc or something. And I'll usually just keep my notepad open in another tab. And then as thoughts pop into my head, like this wasn't working or I'm not sure who's speaking here or something's missing, then I would just kind of jot down the page number and the thought that I had, not anything too detailed. Because that's kind of what I want to know is, is what are you thinking? What's confusing as you go through my book? And then when I'm done with that, I'll go back and say, okay, here are the big picture things that stood out. So how do you, both of you go about beta reading for someone else? 
that's almost exactly what I do. I just take notes during it and then I write a letter at the end kind of summarizing it and then I ask them if they want the want the individual notes too. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 I'm very similar. I, I The book I'm reading right now is, in a, is a PDF. So I just... I put comments, so I just run through the you know run through the manuscript, tap down comments, and then you know to, I add comments and then uh, collect them all. And I think what you were saying, Jackie, really made me kind of think about it that the process of beta reading for someone else is the refinement process for knowing what you want in your beta reads, so you're able to kind of pull out the questions, like oh you know what. Right. Because you, you're kind of looking for the things that you want to have looked at for your own work. Right, right. And you all, and once you're a writer, you read things so analytically, which is, I think, a blessing and a curse. And I always, when I'm beta reading, both having beta readers for myself and beta reading for someone else, I always think of that Neil, Neil Gaiman quote, which is, you know, when someone tells you that something is wrong with the story, they're almost always right. I'm paraphrasing here, but if someone tells you how to fix it, they're almost always wrong. Right. And so your job as a beta reader is basically not to tell the author how to fix it, but tell them something here isn't working for me. Right. I'm not connecting with this story for some reason. You know, that's the huge thing. I mean, this is this is the alpha reader condition, the reading group, you know, the, the writer's group condition, the beta reader condition. You, you know, these are very turbulent ecosystems of egos and creativity. And so you really do have to find the right tempered individuals who you work with and to be able to not say, hey, do this or here's this, you know, because it's a temptation. If you're involved, you go, oh, I really, oh, we're really good if you did this. Oh, that's a good point. And we've been adding uh, audience Q&A to our episodes um, just to kind of get the community more involved. And we got a few questions for this topic. And so let's dive into those and then just see what we cover and, and which of mine and Becca's questions are left. But I feel like we're naturally covering a lot of ground. So the first question is from Phil Rude on Instagram, philrude75. And he's actually the author of our fabulous writing or the illustrator of our fabulous writing goat. So he's a friend of writing block. <laughs> right on. So his question is, have you ever gotten feedback from a beta reader that is a valid change on its own, but maybe flies in the face of the overall statement the story is making? What do you do in that case? Do you retool everything to make the point of the story come through with more clarity? Or do you simply disregard that specific feedback? Go for it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You get this information that comes back, which really has you questioning fundamental elements of your story at times. I'm not a person who believes that one thing exists in a specific way and otherwise it can't exist. Like it, it, it's not ruined. I, I feel everything is workable and fixable. So I have a firm belief that if you just look at it at the right angle, you can incorporate this, you can adjust things, you can make things work. Because ultimately, if if what that person says is that elemental, you know, into, into the core of your story, then it's a different story. Cute, Becca. Do you have any experience with that where some feedback comes back and it's just not really reflecting the essence of your book if you were to make those changes? Not really. Not that I can think of, but I think maybe it's because I took that feedback the way you're talking about with that Neil Gaiman quote in that, like, maybe they're just telling me that something isn't working. Like, it's not like they're saying that the whole story needs to be <laughs> revamped. They're just, the, I, the, the fact that they might think that is telling me that something isn't working. So I'm just going to look at that and try to figure out more specifically what it is. Right, right. I can think of maybe times that I've gotten feedback that was like just really overarching feedback where it was like, why don't you change this person's profession? Or why don't you make this character, you know, just like completely different? And then you have to step back and be like, okay, what about this are they trying to express? Because I'm not going to change this person's profession. Because <laughs> you know? that is a large part of the story to me. And so, yeah, just kind of seeing it as they're expressing that that something within this dynamic isn't working and it's up to me to figure out how to how to smooth that out. And that doesn't mean that every beta reader that I get that I'm going to 
you know, change my story exactly to their vision that they're seeing as they're reading it. It made me think of something that a few people have said, read, you know, reading through my works, and the, they'll they'll pull out a character and they just love a specific character, you know, like a secondary character. Oh, I love this character. This character is great. I want to know more about this character. And you just go, well, this character is not really part, you know, like not the purpose of the story. So do you get any of that? I do. And I, for uh, the seclusion, it was definitely Oliver in that. Mm -hmm. I think everyone liked him more than anyone else in my book. And so I had to be like, okay, how can I make his role bigger and more fun? And I think it's good to, that means you're doing something right, right? You've, you've put some characteristics into this character that people are resonating with. And so I think if you can fit them in more to your story, then, yeah. then why not? I wouldn't take it as anything other than a compliment that you've written. You've written a character that people are connecting with. But sometimes it can be frustrating when you're like, okay, well, this side character is way more popular than my my protagonist. And so how do I make sure that I'm vamping up everybody else's personalities as well? Well, yeah, I guess the question is, <laughs> is everyone else that dull and this character that much right. more interesting? How was Oliver in your earlier draft? You know, was he involvement much lower or did you have to pull it up? It's very hard for me to remember what my like earliest drafts were because the, the story changed so much. But yes, I, I am. I don't think Oliver even existed in my first draft. And then he became one of the best characters. And then um, not to be too spoilery, but the book that will come out next March, the sequel, some of the story is told from his perspective. And so I kind of took that as, okay, people really love this character. He's going to be one of the main voices in the second book. And he's my favorite character to write. I feel like th there's also characters that you'll resonate with that are more natural for you to write. And he's been one of those characters where when I write his chapters, they, they just come out very clearly. I hear his voice very clearly. And sometimes it's not the character you think it would be. Like, it's it's really not my protagonist. Mm -hmm. Oliver's chapters are a lot easier for me to naturally nail on that first pass for some reason. And so you got to go with that too. <laughs> no, I, I love I love having the supporting characters be as sort of interesting to write as the primary characters, you know, character. It just, I don't know, it allows me to kind of discover more about their story, which makes mm -hmm. the whole story that much better, I hope. For sure. So this kind of, we talked about this a little bit, but we can dive in a little more. This is from Who Wants Dinner on Instagram, which we know is our writing block friend, Jason Pomerantz, who has been on the podcast before. And he says, friends as beta readers, question mark. Good idea, bad. <laughs> I've had good and not so good experiences and wondering what others think. Who would like to take that one first? Yeah, so I kind of mentioned before that the friends I had read it were just too positive almost. I didn't get enough critique that I needed. But I think another downside is you have to be careful about people who are willing to read your book more than once. Because my friends, I really want to read the final book too. And so mm -hmm. if they're only going to go through it once, I don't want to like waste that on a beta read. I want them to read the the good stuff. So that's another another downside I've thought about. Right. I think for me, it's just a friend by friend basis. I mean, I think that as writers, we all have those groups of friends who are not writers whose eyes kind of glaze over as we keep talking about our books over and over again. And so we start to figure out which spaces are really good for brainstorming. And, and we figure out which friends are really excited to hear about our story. And you definitely don't want to put a strain on a friendship because for people that aren't used to beta reading or aren't writers themselves, Reading a, a full book and giving notes, thats a, it's a lot to ask of someone if they're not used to that. And so I think it just really depends on the friendship, if you feel like they're going to be honest with you, if they're going to have some critiques, and then if you feel like your friendship is a give and take. Like, there are definitely friends where I'm like, okay, even if you're not a writer yourself, there's some way that I'm going to help you out too. And so you don't want to strain a friendship in that way. And then the other thing I would mention too is that it's okay to not give them your full book. Like, it's okay to be like, I need to find a few people that are going to look over the first 50 pages and give me their input on how the story starts out and the pacing. And then maybe you get some feedback and 
and three of your friends had like some really exciting ideas and they were obviously very into it. And then you can say, hey, you want to look at another 50 pages. And instead of just, yeah, so that kind of gives everybody room to test the waters and see if that's, and then if they never get back to you in six months, you're like, okay, that person is probably not interested in me asking them again to beta read. (laughs) Yeah. I will agree with that, Jackie. I do have a friend, Chris Hinkle, who read, I like to give people shout outs, especially because poor Chris, (laughs) he looked at my prologue for probably four or five times and helped me rework my prologue. And now it's cut from the book. I'm sorry, Chris. (laughs) Thank you for your help. (laughs) But he's still going to be in the acknowledgements. So you might want to warn your friends if they're going to just look at a part of your book that like, it might not be there. (laughs) Well, and the other thing that just popped into my head is, you know, take your friend's interests into account too. Like I have my sister-in-law, like works in a research lab. So there were times when I would say, can you just look at this scene and tell me if anything is jumping out as like too out there or doesn't fit in with that environment. And so there may be friends who like have an interest in something that you are expressing in the book and you just want them to read a chapter or two and let you know, you know, how it, how it flows. And that's, I think, very different than saying, can you read a few hundred pages and and get it back to me by Wednesday, you know? (laughs) So you got to give people, meet people where they are. And obviously friends that are writers are going to receive that very differently. And they do not mind saying, you read this book and I'll read yours next time. That's exactly what I did. I mean, I think one of my readers is a writer and he was a writer for years, just hasn't, you know, kind of put the the process to the side. And, um, but he's a huge reader of the genres that are in my book so i figured he was a good mark you know mark he's a good target and so the reader you know the those readers typically since they're writing books or they're in the process of writing a book or they want to write a book they're eager to kind of engage into the process of the beta read and i don't know if i i mean i don't think my friends are really big on holding back with me like they're going to say something because i've always said things so they'll always say stuff back to me which i guess is healthy ish but this does lead to a very important point which i've learned in the in the beta reading process when you are asking friends or acquaintances to read your book deadlines this is the one thing that i did not put down in the handover And I think that might have been mostly because of maybe a sense of inadequacy, you know, feeling, oh, hey, would you please read this, you know, kind of sort of point of view versus you're going to love reading this and I need it back within two months. You know, that would be great. Um, I handed everything off to the majority of the readers February 24th, I believe. So we are nearly two months in and I have one two three people who have read all the whole the entire book so i have one person who's given a full feedback and done a phone conversation about the feedback the other two have just completed it so i will probably get their feedback within a week and i'll have a follow-up phone call but you know the others are not completely there yet so i have to you know i so i found that i had to do a bit of that chasing after you know, hey, how's everything going? Oh, by the way, <laughs> how you doing? And, you know, do, recording this was a great excuse to do a check-in. Hey, I'm just trying to get some statistics. Where are you? So I can make sure that I can have something to talk about. But, and then I asked, I said, you know, for the people who really hadn't, you know, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt that they've started the book, but I don't think they have. And I said, hey, you know, is there anything that I could have done that would have improved this process for you to be you know, productive? And the one answer straight up was a deadline would have been nice. So I said, okay, that's, that's a fair, that's a fair thing. So then I, after gathering the information, I came back a day later and I said, can you have this back to me by May 15th? And they said, sure. I said, okay, great. Well, and I think that it does, you know, it does, it can come across as I'd like to start working on my next draft by this date. It doesn't need to be like you demanding that that it's back at a certain date so you can kind of give give them what your goal is to start turning around and putting implementing the feedback for sure 
So we had one more that kind of talks about what we we can expand on what we were just talking about. But Peter Harmon, who is another writing block friend, asked, what are good platforms to find beta readers? I use close friends. Is there value to seeking out strangers? What's a good turnaround time to give them? So that's kind of what we were just talking about. What I tend to do with turnaround time is once I'm into reading it, like I I try to be honest if I'm like, I have a few things I'm reading first, I probably won't start on this for a month, is once I start, I try to get through like 100 pages a week and send notes as I read it. Because then at least if they're going back to start their new draft, you know, those, the, the notes on those, that first part of the book gets to them sooner because I probably am not always able to get <laughs> get through a large book really quickly with notes while doing other things. And um, yeah, anybody else have any feedback on, on what you think is a reasonable turnaround time to ask of someone? I mean, at least if somebody's asking me, I tend to get through about one print book, two audiobooks, and an ebook per month. Like that's just my reading pace. And I treat beta reading as one of my ebooks. So whenever I start, I try to like that's my month. It takes me about yeah. a month. Okay. Yeah, I um I took advantage of the beta reading process because I have another I have another novel I'm I was prepping. So I felt, well, I can take the time while people are doing the reading to work this this new book up to get it and get it in shape to write a manuscript but that was probably why i didn't give a deadline your mind starts going boy wouldn't it be great to get back to that and you know take care of that issue because that that definitely is an issue and i really need to take care of that so you're you get this 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 sort of niggling distraction in the back of your head but um I, i mean i guess it all depends on the size of the book i mean my book is not short so to to say to somebody, hey, could you have it back in a month is a pretty big ask. Two months, I think, is a fair ask for somebody to to read it with attention and write feedback for, you know, a 400 plus page book. Did either of you have any resources for Peter and the rest of his question, which is platforms for finding beta readers? I know we've talked about how we've mostly looked for paid beta beta readers or our friends. I feel like there are some like forums out there for exchanging beta reads or finding critique partners, but none of those names are are coming to me right now. I don't know if Becca, if you know any of those. Twitter, but also NaNoWriMo, the community has a forum and there's a beta reader exchange that I think is pretty tit for tat. (laughs) Oh, that's great. Okay, I'll put a link to that in our show notes and I'll also just... Do a quick search and see if I can rustle up a few more, and I'll add those there too. I would also, if you're in, a, if you're in a uh, a writers group as well, like you know, a loose writers group, which I am a member of, and I absolutely did not take. I took it. No, I I did ask one person from the group. So, and I and I expect to get the probably the most comprehensive response from this individual because that's just how they are. Yeah. So a writers group, and I think I think there's probably myriad groups out there online that you could find Mm -hmm. that don't cost money. Yeah. And I think that figuring out exactly what you want, like if you really want a little more detail, you might try to, instead of searching for beta reader, search for like critique partner. And then that may be someone that you can trade back and forth, forth with a few times. That reminds me of something. And I'm, I'm not in that position, but maybe either one of you I mean, I know, Jackie, there's plenty of people who've read your book. And I know authors, what they do with their for their beta readers is they have people who love their book who would line up for a chance to be a beta reader on the on the novel. So that seems to be a real good target market approach for, you know, beta reading possibilities. Yeah. Well, and I think as you have a larger network, then you'll, you know, hope the, the goal or the hope is that you then have plenty of people who are really excited, especially at the thought of helping you develop your story. I think that it is kind of a unique thing when you're trying to find beta readers for a sequel. You know, you don't want to find someone that didn't read the first book and then task them with reading two books. And so it it is a kind of a unique challenge is you want to find people that have already read the first book, hopefully didn't hate it, and then could have some feedback to help you develop that, that second one. And I'm sure Alex being with 
science fiction, you'll run into that because that lends itself to series for sure. I also want to say beta reading makes you a better writer. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) we're kind of framing this like it's such an obligation, (laughs) which it is a big commitment, but I've learned a lot through reading other people's unfinished books. Oh, for sure. And just dissecting it and figuring out how to give voice to what's not working can definitely be internalized as you're going through that process. I think that I think the two things, you know, if if you can be a reader and if you can any any chance to do any sort of editing, <laughs> you know, those are the two things that are going to make you better at the writing process because you can learn the distillation process or learn the observational process. I have a question regarding beta readers for both of you in the terms of beta readers and alpha readers. I'm seeing a very clear path in the people at least some of the people I've chosen in my beta reading process for them to become alpha readers just based off of their involvement and based off of their observations and their feedback. Uh, Do either one of you look at your beta readers as a sort of a minor league to move it up to the, you know, majors? I honestly (laughs) don't know if I will ever use, I guess, an alpha reader again. (laughs) Um, Even though we've said like it can kind of be nice to have a set of eyes to tell you if something's worthwhile. I just through the process of like writing the few books I've written now and seeing how how much editing my books need to be decent. I just it's it's embarrassing to me at this point. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like I don't know if I'll ever use an alpha reader for like giving them an entire book. I think that what I have done and what I would do in the future is if I have the beginning of a book, and I just want to run it by someone that I trust and say, what are your initial feelings on this? Where are you kind of seeing that this story could go? And just getting kind of feedback like that on the on kind of the story seed of an idea. I That's guess kind of what I would Carrie, lean towards. Jackie yeah, Carrie and, and I have done that a good of, bit. And even you two for me, like I've been like, oh, here's my idea. And okay, mm-hmm. this is what this character is going to be like. And so bouncing those ideas off of yeah is one thing but I'm not going to make you read my first draft (laughs) right or even just yeah here's a couple pages do you like the voice Um, my newest book is written as a confessional and so you know I did run it by some people like does it is this weird is this a good intro are you liking the style because it's kind of outside of my wheelhouse and I think that's a great way to do it Alex why don't you let everyone know how they can keep up with what you're doing well you can Follow me online at uh, J Alex Morrissey, all one word, on both Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can also see me weekly make a fool of myself at drawdrinkin.com. Uh, it'll lead you to the YouTube or Facebook channels where we have our weekly interviews with comic book creators from around, around the country. Yeah, and uh, you can also go to alex underscore morrissey.com and... Uh, you know, whatever might be there is there. Who knows? Might be some design work, might be some writing, or might be some illustration. Who knows? Yeah, for sure. And definitely check out Alex's illustration. He is very talented. And we're excited to see that first book hit shelves once you're done with the beta reading and the editing process. And um, yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you both for having me. It's been a a blast. And uh, I'm excited, you know, I'm excited for the beta reading phase to be done because I want to get back to writing the book. (laughs) For sure. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Alex. And thanks, Becca. Thanks for listening to the Indie Writer Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode and will subscribe to hear our future episodes. We want to thank the Writing Block community for the continued support. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, or at writingblock.com, no K. Remember to subscribe, share, and tell your friends. Thanks, everyone, and happy writing!